Let us remain standing just a moment till we meet God in prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank Thee today from the depths of our hearts for the privilege that we have of calling Thee our Father. We read in the Bible where the Spirit would cry, Abba, Father, my God, my God. And we're so happy today that we have been included in this great number of the redeemed. And we are here this afternoon for no other purpose but to worship Thee, to read Thy Word, and to find out how we could be better servants of Yours, and to live a closer Christian walk for You and with You. And we pray that You will meet with us around the world and will give to us that deep desire that we so want in our hearts. And we'll praise thee, for we ask it in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. I am so happy to be here this afternoon in the service of the Lord. And I trust that our little gathering together will be to his praise. <coughs> And now many of the brethren, and the brethren that's with me, was assembled out in other places today where they were having worship. And the place where I was at this morning, we had a wonderful time over to the Assemblies of God Church. And um, so we had a wonderful service, and I know you did also. And we are thankful that you're out this afternoon, and we feel that somehow we just can't get enough of God. And there's something about the gospel and the Word of God that we just simply can't seem to get enough of it. I believe you could, you might eat too much sometimes. And you might drink enough good cold water to make you sick. But I don't believe that a man could ever pray too much or get too much of the love of God in his heart. There's just one thing that just doesn't seem to ever get enough, fill up. And I'm taught that when we eat, if we are used to eating small portions, our stomach shrinks to that potion. And if we eat much, our stomach stretches to that. And I think we need some spiritual stretching. <laughs> just much of the word. Can't be satisfied with just reading a little verse once in a while or something of that manner. But stretching our spiritual gastronomics. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, isn't this brother and sister Peterson sitting right here from Minneapolis? I believe I've seen Captain Statscliffe here, your son-in-law, last night, um, chaplain in the, in the army. I don't see him today. Yes, here he is over here. Well, you're going to be here through the meeting, I suppose, and I hope to get to see you before coming out. I won't go at the post with you, if the Lord will him in California. Well, we're going to read just the first part of one verse and part of another verse out of the 36th chapter of Ezekiel. And that is the 26th and, uh, I mean, the 36th and the 37th verse. 26th and 27th verse. A new heart also will I put within you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Then in the 27th verse, and I will put my spirit within you. Now, as we have before us this text, we trust that God will give us a context from this. And we are trusting solemnly in the Holy Spirit to bring out the context of this text. 
In the Bible, there are many great gifts, and God sets those gifts into the church in order for the perfecting of the church. And now, I wish to take my subject this afternoon on this, and to you who are writing it down and so forth, and for the tape, why is it that so many Christians find it so hard to live the Christian life? I think that would be, seemingly to me, a very vital subject this afternoon. Why is it that sun seems to be on the housetop all the time, and others seem to have the ups and downs all the time, and others seem to be practically in the valley all the time? Getting the letters and the reports from the meeting sometimes leads me to prayer to find what would the Lord have me to speak to the church or in the letters and sometimes at night time when the anointing of the discernment is on, you seemingly you could find that confusion and then spirits that seem to be some of them rejoicing and some sad and some disappointed. And sometimes the Holy Spirit brings us to such subject as we have this afternoon. Now we're speaking of Ezekiel some eight or nine hundred years before the coming of the Messiah. In the Bible, the prophets, the word came to the prophets in the days of old. In Hebrews it said, God in sundry time. And divers manners spake to the fathers by the prophets. But in this last day he has spoke to us through his Son, Christ Jesus. Now the prophets were seers, divine seers. And it's a change of the dispensation. From law unto grace did not change God, sending still prophets. For in the New Testament we find prophecy went on just the same. And also prophets went on just the same. Prophecy is a gift. It's a gift that might be on one and then another in any local church, and every one may prophesy one by one. But a prophet is an office of the church. Not a gift in the church, but an office of the church. A prophet. They are not, they are ordained, predestined, by God's foreknowledge to be what they are. They're born prophets. Prophets are not made. They are born prophets. And a prophet or seer, in one word, is considered in the Old Testament as eagles. And how I love to think of it in that way, as an eagle. I've put much of my life in conservation, as you know, in studying wildlife, studying birds, wild birds, wild animals, learning their nature. And I find that an eagle is the most interesting bird merely that I know of outside the dove. The eagle is a bird of prey, but he's also a bird of the heavens. And in a certain book reading one time were a, a terrible sight. The sea eagle in a cage. And this eagle, this great mammoth bird, would get back and fly against the cage as hard as he could, only to hit his head and come back. Fall on the floor, look around. He'd flog his great wings against the cage again. 
He'd just been caged. And as he'd flog his wings, he had all the hide and feathers beat off his wings, off the parts of his body, where he had so breath to get out of that cage. And when we'd hit the cage, he'd fall back. Weary eyes would look up towards the heavens. He knew he was born a heaven-soaring bird. That's his nature. That was a sad sight. One of the saddest I ever seen. But I see a sight in Phoenix and the world over that's a much sadder sight than that. I see men and women who were born to be sons and daughters of God and who are caged by the devil. And to see them walking the streets in lust and passion, caged in by the devil, when really they should be free, sons and daughters of God. Now an eagle can fly higher than any other bird there is. There's no bird can climb where the eagle climbs. And neither was there any man who, whether he was teacher, evangelist, pastor, could climb to the spot where them prophets went. For they went way up, and higher you go, further you can see away. And this bird was made. No other bird could stand it up there. The eagle's eye is the sharpest eye of any bird. Why, he can outdo the hawk in any way. Because the hawk has a sharp eye, but just for a certain distance. But the eagle is more powerful because he goes higher than the hawk. He goes up to where the hawk would die if he tried to come to him. His body is not made like that. Oh, how I could stop right here by the help of God and show you how some people try to climb to places where others stand. You just wasn't made that way. You just can't stand it. And these eagles would go up. Could King Hezekiah ever climb where Elijah was? Though he was the greatest man in the kingdom. The king. But when he turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly, God spoke to Isaiah to go tell him. Isaiah could climb where Hezekiah could not. Though Hezekiah could speak a word here on earth as a hawk, and everything bowed at his feet. Isaiah couldn't do that. But Isaiah could climb into a place where Hezekiah couldn't climb. All these things are for purposes. So God's eagle, Ezekiel, climbed up into a place to where he could see some 15, 18, yes, 2,000, 500 years ahead, seeing things. If you could go high enough above the earth, you could see night and day at the same time. Dark on one side and light on the other. So you could see the world over if you could get high enough and your eyes could focus to that. So Ezekiel climbed up so high that he saw our day. God's eagle. And he told us what would take place in this day. Now I want to ask you something. The church seems to be out of cater somewhere. Now we've got at least a good hour here. So let's just sit down and take our helmets off and listen just for a few minutes. Now notice. If God intended his church to be run upon intellectuals, 
then it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to do anything in the church. We do not need the Holy Spirit if the church is to be run upon intellectual. Then we should find the smartest man we can find to be our pastor. And the biggest buildings that we can build and the more members we can get into our church and root out the illiterate and bring in the intellectual, better the church would be if that is the program. If that's the program, the smarter the preacher, the smarter the congregation, the more intellectual they are, the better the church will be. But I can't find one place in all the Holy Scriptures where God's church is to be run upon the wisdom of man. And as long as we try to run it upon the intellectual of man, we are absolutely fighting the air. God's church is to be run up by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then if we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to run the church, then it doesn't take too much intellectual. It doesn't take education. It takes the Holy Spirit. That's God's program. Now, we know that. We don't have to find the smartest people in the city to make our church better. We don't have to find the best dressed people in the city to make our church better. We don't need the biggest crowds in the city to make our church better. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit to make our church better. Intellectuals have very little to do with it. I'm not trying to support illiteracy, but education has taken the place in the church of the Holy Spirit. Education's all right, but that is not God's program. If education was to take the place, Christ would establish schools when he was on earth. Christ never did establish a school. But Christ established the church. And not a church of intellectuals, but out of a bunch of illiterate fishermen who were willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and be led accordingly. Now, the church doesn't need a group of intellectuals. The church needs a birth. The church needs to be born again. If the Holy Spirit is going to lead the church, then the Holy Spirit will lead the church not according to some ritual, but according to the Bible. Because so this is the rules he laid down in the beginning. The church needs a baptism. The church doesn't need a polishing up. A better scholar is a pulpit. A better dressed man. A better dressed congregation. It needs a new heart. What the church needs. It needs the Holy Spirit. It needs that great unction that changes men and women's lives. How God promised that He would take the old stony heart out and put a new heart in you. Then when this happens, a change has been made. Now, in preaching these things, even to the Pentecostal people, 
And we have so little to brag about. For in where we have tried to have a Pentecostal free move of God, we have become to a place of a bunch of colonized cults almost. Just a place of confusion and discord. What ought to happen here this afternoon? There should be every Pentecostal church in the city jammed into some big stadium out here somewhere. And if it wasn't for little petty indifferences among the ministers and the people, it would be that way. A new heart will I give you. Not I'll polish the old one up, but I'll give you a new one. Now, you hard. We think it's hard to preach truth amongst Baptists and Presbyterians, the intellectuals, but it's twice as hard to preach the truth before Pentecostals. Right. Now, the Bible has told us that you can't put new wine in old bottles. That one stumbled me. I couldn't understand. A bottle of, I know up here, and we in America, is a glass affair. And what difference would it make if we put wine in the new bottle or the old bottle? But when I was in the Orient, I learned that the bottle in the Bible day was not a glass bottle. It was a bottle that was made out of animal skin. They taken the skin from the animal and tanned it. Now, as long as the the oil from the animal skin is in the skin, it's flexible. But when the skin gets old and set and dry, then it isn't flexible anymore. Bless the Lord. The skin becomes dry and sick, but it won't give no more. And to put new, unfermented wine that's got life in it yet into a skin like that wouldn't be wisdom. When the wine begins to ferment and to stretch, the skin bursts. And you lose both bottle and wine. Jesus said in another place, cast not pearls before swine. You lose your pearls. And you take a church that is so set in its way. Let it be Baptist, Pentecostal, or whatever it is, that is so set that when the new wine comes in, and the... One comes by the word, and that new word begins to say, The days of miracles are here again. That old, dried-up skin will, when that new wine begins to take hold, it can't move, because it's shut in what it believes and won't move, and the skin busts open and pops open. I can't breathe in miracles. There you are. When the Holy Spirit begins to say that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that falls in an old dry church hide, you know what happens? They just blow up. That's all. If you say the baptism of the Holy Spirit was promised on the day of Pentecost to you and to your children, and to them that is far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, the old dry skin just burst open and you lose your sermon. Right. It doesn't do any good. 
And I'm ashamed that Pentecostal skins are drawn like that. Come back to the Word. Notice, now a new skin. He said new wine is put into new bottles. And the new skin has oil in it. Flexible. And then when the Holy Spirit comes down and says the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same today as it ever was, divine healing is the same as it ever was, that new wine begins to spread out and the skin gives with it. Every time the Word of God is preached in its power, the new skin of our Amen. It'll give away. So you see the wisdom in a new bottle or new wine. On the day of Pentecost, there was 120 new skins laying on the floor. Now you find out the old skins is cast outside. But when God came from the heavens and filled these new skins, they got new life and began to bounce all over the floor, even bounced out the door into the windows, into the streets. New skins with new bottles, new wine, Holy Ghost wine, pour out, full of life, just Wretching and giving and oh, brother John, I don't care what denomination you belong to. I love you anyhow. I don't care whether you're oneness, twoness, threeness, fiveness. We are brothers. That's the new thing. Whether we're Assembly's Church of God, four square, whatever we are, the new skin steps come out and take in every brother that is around. But the old cowhide won't do that. It's right, it won't do it. Somehow it just won't do it. It's all dried and sick. And it'll burst. Some time ago up in northern British Columbia, I was hunting. After a great meeting, and I was so tired, and I went back about, it was about 1,100 miles from a hard top road. About 175 miles back with 21 horses. And I got to chase an old bear that day. It was raining. And I didn't want to shoot the old fella. I just wanted to look at him. But he was determined I wasn't going to do that. And I had a little horse about three years old that had tried ever since I've been riding to throw me. And up to the hills we went chasing this old bear. And somehow or another, trying to cut across this gulch and over that, I got turned around. Well, now, you don't want to do that up there. Because there's no roads. There's no places to come out. And somehow, I started wandering. I took my little horse from up top of the mountain, looked around. I thought I had my general directions, although the fog was on. I started back towards where I thought I could find camp, riding along pretty swiftly. Well, it was getting towards dark, and the winds come up and blow away the fogs, and by, I say, nine o'clock at night, we have what we call buttermilk skies. I do. You have them like clouds in it, some white clouds, like buttermilk does. And the moon would shine, and, and then go behind the clouds, and then shine again. My little horse is sweating pretty heavy, so I felt led that I should stop the little fellow and let him rest. And I... Stopped him and tied him up pretty close, fenced him up, or unfenced the saddle rather, and tied him up close. And I sat down on the log. I was sitting there wondering, I said, Oh God, how great thou art. Looking around. And just then the winds are blowing. And I heard the most mournful noise I ever heard. I thought, What's making that real funny noise? And I looked just ahead of me, and there was an old burnover. I guess you all know what a burnover is, where there's been trees, and the fires went through and burned all the bark off of them, and they're just standing there. Some of them blow down and hard to get through. 
And every time the wind would blow, then that wind going down through those old white bare trees, and the moon shining on them, it looked very, well, I should say they called it in a street expression, spooky. Kind of a funny feeling here, you. It looked like graveyards, tombstones sticking up. And every time that wind would blow, that real mournful sound would set up in them trees. Oh, such a sound. I thought, isn't that a spooky looking place? And I all stood and looked at it a little while. I thought, you know, this reminds me of a text I used to use over in Joel. Said what the palmer worm has left, the caterpillar has eaten. What the caterpillar left, that the canker worm eaten. What the canker worm left, the locust has eaten. I thought, well, that sure is a picture of joy. And I thought, yes, that reminds me of all that mournful noise of these great, big, high-standing steeples on churches, great, big denominations behind them, but not a bit of light, like the old guy cowhide. Then every time God sends down that rushing mighty wind, like he did on the day of Pentecost, the only thing they can do is just groan, moan. The days of miracles is past. Don't you go around such stuff. Oh, it won't do anything. Just moaning and groaning. Well, I thought, what don't them trees, what makes them moan? It's because they haven't got any life in them. That's the reason they're moaning. Well, I thought if they had life in them, they could sway with this wind. Well, I said, that's right. What the Lutheran left has the Methodists eaten. What the Methodists left, the Presbyterians eaten. What the Presbyterians left, the Baptists eaten. What the Baptists left, the Nazarenes eaten. What the Nazarenes left, the Pentecostals eaten. I thought it sure come down to a big old bunch of bleached churches with nothing in them. That's exactly right. right. Just when a revival hits down, I'll have nothing to do with it. No. Keep away from that. Oh, brother. That was a pretty dark picture till I happened to think that Joel said, but I will restore, saith the Lord. Then I thought, Lord, how are you going to do this? Then another great wind swept down again. And I noticed down beneath these old trees were standing a bunch of little scrubs, just little bitty trees coming up, little scrub fellas. <laughs> but every time the wind blowed and caught into those little old trees, they would just scream and jump and hold on one another, and just, as David said, clap their hands. How they were just as flexible if the wind blowed them over here to Jones's, it was all right. If it blowed them over to, to the Simmons, it was all right. If it blowed them back to the four square, it was all right. They were just as flexible as they could be. Everyone was so shaped together. I will restore saith the Lord. I noticed the strange thing of it. I said, well, there's one thing. Some trees are green. But they're flexible. <laughs> they got life. So you see, brother, the Holy Ghost wasn't sent for stark, stiff, dead intellectuals. It was sent for a green, born again, men and women in the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit wasn't sent to the intellectual. It's sent to those who are humble hearts and the contract spirit. No matter if they're educated or not educated, whether they're scrubs or whatever they are, they're flexible to the Holy Spirit. And then I asked the question to myself, I thought, oh, what makes the wind blow to begin with? 
Is it just because the wind wants to blow? And something seemed to say to me, no, it isn't because it wants to blow, but every time them little trees shake and give away, it loosens up the roots so they can grow deeper and get a better hold. <laughs> that is the principle of a revival. A people who are flexible, not to an intellectual talk, but to the coming of the Holy Spirit in the form of the baptism that gives the way to the Word of God and rejoice in the flexible and the anointing of the Spirit. What does it do to the church? It loosens up the roots of the church and makes it grow over and wrap its roots around Jones' church. And Jones wraps the roots around this church. And the first thing you know, together they are one big united forest together. All the devils of hell couldn't shake them then. But that's the trouble. That's what it is. Now notice the scripture order, says you. I will give you a new heart. Not a polished step one. Not one that's kind of uh, old. The old lady don't need a face lifting. She needs a birth. That's what she needs. The old church needs to be born again. Now he never said, I'll polish up the old heart. He said, I'll take the old stony heart out of you and put a new one in. That new heart. That new heart sets right in the middle of your innermost being. The heart is the occupant place of the soul. They didn't know that in science till not long ago. The old critical science used to say, God made a mistake when he said, as a man believeth in his heart. The Bible was wrong, so there's no mental faculties in the heart. You believe with your head. If God, I'm a literalist. I don't want to spiritualize any of the word. I want to say just what the word says. I believe it that way. The Bible said it's of no private interpretation. And if God would have meant head, he'd have said head. But he said heart. So we find out that a few years ago, about three years ago now, two years ago it's been, on the headlines of the Chicago paper, there had come an article that they found a little compartment in the human heart, it isn't in the animal heart, or no other heart but the human, a little place where there's not even a blood cell. And they say it is the uh, apartment, compartment there, that occupies the soul. So God was right. A man thinks with his head, but believes with his heart. Right. The intellectual will reason. Oh, I'm too bad. I can't do this. This oh, if I'd go over there, I'd be uh, oh. See, that's reason. But the heart doesn't reason. It just accepts the word the way it is and believes it. The Bible said we should cast down reason. That's right. We're to believe, not reason. Just believe it. A new heart will I give you. Now here's where many of the people have made a mistake. And a new spirit will I give you. Now he never said, I'll just polish up the old spirit and polish up the old heart, but I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Now many people thought that to be the Holy Spirit, and they made a mistake. The Methodists thought surely they had it when they shouted. Said, brother, we got it. Anybody that shouts, but they found out there's a lot shouted didn't have it. <laughs> Right. Along come the Pentecostals and said, when we speak with tongues, we got it. But they found out a lot of people with tongues that didn't have it. <laughs> That's right. You admit that. Well, now we got all kinds of other things we're coming yet and got it till you get it. But brother, you haven't got it until there is the Spirit of God comes from heaven and changes your life that makes the fruits of your life a different person. By the fruit you shall know them. That's the reason you have so much ups and downs. You get a new spirit, you quit your drinking. You get a new spirit, you quit your drinking. Lying. You get a new spirit, you can do most anything with that spirit. 
But that isn't what God's talking about. A new spirit, he said, I'll give you, now what? I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit. Well, I'd have to give you a new spirit to live for me. Well, you couldn't even live with yourself with the spirit you did have. You couldn't live with your neighbor. You couldn't associate with the next man on the next corner. You couldn't associate with these Christians. Well, you had an awful spirit. So he has to give you a new spirit. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit. Now watch. And I will put my spirit in you. There's the difference. I'll put my spirit in you. And that's where you find it so hard that you go down to church and you get a different concept. You know what? I believe I ought to go to church. Then you go back home and say, Hallelujah, I got it. No, you haven't. Then you go down to church and you say, Oh, I believe that something's happened. I don't look at things the way I used to. Hallelujah. In a few days you find yourself right down in the same old rut you were. Doubting, reasoning, everything else. Well, now, if pastor so-and-so said that wasn't right, I don't believe it's right. I'll just take his word for it, and I'll tell you I'm going to do this and do that. And you find yourself up and down and in and out. See, you just didn't go far enough. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, I, I got all the evidences. I know that we're not talking about evidences. We're talking about the product. Right. Yes, sir. I've seen heathen shout. I've seen them speak with tongues. I've seen them lay down a pencil and write in unknown tongues and a witch raise up and read it, interpret it, and tell the truth. If a man could speak with tongues, if a man could shout, if a man could see visions, if a man could do any of these other things they can do without divine love, they are lost. Right. Christ is in the heart. See? So don't be deceived by signs and evidences. There's all kinds of signs. The Bible said in the last days false prophets rise up and show such signs that would deceive the very elect if possible. Come back to the Bible signs. Notice. Now I'll give you a new spirit. And I'll put my spirit. Notice. The new heart is put right in the middle of you. And the new spirit is put right in the middle of your new heart. And his spirit is put right in the middle of the new spirit. It's just like the mainspring in a famous watch. When that red mainspring sets in the middle of the watch, it controls every movement of that watch. And that's what's the matter, friends. Now, I hope you see this and I'm not saying it to be trying to twist or be indifferent. I'm only saying it because I know that someday I'll stand as a judgment with you. You see, if the Holy Spirit is in the middle of your spirit, as that watch screen makes all the rest of the movement just tick just exactly to the place, keeping perfect time, when the Holy Spirit is in the middle of your spirit, it makes every action of the Holy Spirit in you tick off just exactly according to God's time piece of Bible. Right? You don't lie, you don't steal, you got so shaped, you're lovely, and you got peace, joy, long suffering, goodness, meekness, patience. Well, all the fruits of the Spirit just ticks right with that mainspring. See what I mean? Now, it's the mainspring that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. It isn't your church that does it. It isn't your pastor that does it. It isn't your shop that does it. It isn't your speaking with tongues that does it. It isn't your healing service that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. God's Holy Spirit in the middle of your new spirit. It makes the whole church operate just exactly one big bundle of God. Oh, don't we need it, friends. Examine ourselves today. Examine it by the Word. See, is our life ticking off just like that? See, everything. Love. What's the fruit of it? How you want to keep in right time? It's got love. Love falls itself. It's not puffed up. It's sociable, neighborly, loving. Leaving all things, hoping all things. 
love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience, meek, faith, all of these fine qualities is taken out of that person's life when the Holy Spirit's in there taking it around. Now, it wasn't by intellectual conception that this brings forth. It is by the baptism of the Holy Ghost that brings this. If you are trying to live a Christian life, you're only impersonating. It's not, Paul said, it's not me that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. The life that I now live, I live not of myself, but Christ that liveth in me. He becomes dead to all the things of the world, that Christ the main spring in his life, but taken off his life just exactly, exactly the way God had made it down here in the Bible. You get what I mean? That's the reason we're fussing with one another today. That's the reason there's quarreling and stewing among us. That's the reason the sin that can't believe with the oneness or our fellowship. That's the reason the oneness can't believe with the assembly. That's the reason the Methodists won't believe with the Baptists. That's the reason the Presbyterian won't believe with neither one. That's the reason these factions and differences and fusses and stews and all this, that, the other. We might shout, speak with tongues, organize, education, elect, anything that we want to call it. But until God's Holy Spirit comes in the middle of His church and begins to take that power of God, that's what's the matter. See? You are known. Do you mean to tell me that the church of the living God would be anything short of that? So you see, we went to look into evidences instead of the mainspring. We went to look at what a nice case is on it. What a big church we got. How big the steeple is on top of it. How nice our people's church. How our pastor can stand and say, Amen. Like a calf dying with a cringe. We have got all these things into our head and left off the mainspring. For though I speak with tongues as men and angels, though I have gifts so I can move mountains, though I understand all the words, though I have all knowledge, I am nothing. Oh, I simply feel like if I could only have the knowledge or the something to express to you, my people, or the people of our God. Don't leave off the mainspring, no matter how pretty it looks, how much of a watch it looks like. If that mainspring isn't in there, it'll never keep time. We can call ourselves four square assemblies, Presbyterian, Baptist. We can call ourselves Pentecostal, whatever we want to. But as long as that mainspring, the Holy Ghost isn't there, ticking off love, joy, peace, goodness, long suffering, we are just putting on a show. No wonder we can't have real healing services. Where can God lead those sincere people upon a foundation? This is God's foundation. No other foundation can be laid. We might think we're laying the foundation, but we find out the mainspring's gone. The builders thought they could build the temple, and the little old funny mainspring that didn't seem to fit in anywhere. They kicked it out over into a weed pile. But they come to find out it was the chief cornerstone. My brother, sister, we've had all kinds of sensations, all kinds of evidences, all kinds of everything else. But until we come back to the mainspring, our church is only just the size of the rest of them. We've got to come back. So where there's something in the member that gives him peace and joy, he's always on the mountaintop shouting the praises of God. Oh, my. I wish I could get you to see it. Then the yoke becomes easy. It doesn't chaff around the collar. It's lined with love. 
If it's only in line with emotion, it'll soon cap around the collar. You can come to church and shout and dance and whatever you want to. You can go to church and sing, Amen, and repeat the doxology or that so-called Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed never was what they got wrote up. I believe in the Holy Roman Catholic Church and communion of saints. The Bible is against that. If the apostles had any creed, it's repentant. Be baptized every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If they had any creed, it would be something like that. Not communion of saints, that's condemned. But you might be able to say all the catechism of your church and be just as staunch Lutheran as you could be, or Catholic, or whatever you might be, or Methodist. Them to have catechism. To know the catechism is not life. To know the church is not life. To know the Bible is not life. But to know Him is life. The mainspring. Bring you on. Now you can shout a little bit at church and go out on the street and somebody say, You know you're a holy roller? Oh, it chaps real bad. Somebody said, well, look, well, I see you down there tonight shouting till your hair fell down. Well, John, I suppose if that's the way you're going to do it, we might as well get away from it. It's chaffing. But when the mainspring is in there, it lines it with love. And the yoke is easy. And you can bear anything. They call you a holy roller. Call you a fanatic. Anything they want to, the yoke is so easy that you can lay it up on your shoulders when you're yoked up with the mainspring and it's not you anymore, it's him that's picking it up. It's so easy to like Samson with the brazen gates of Gaza. He just packs them away. And when somebody calls you a holy roller or makes fun of you, you just pack the old burden out to a certain mountain called Calvary and pray for him. Amen. That's when love comes. Love. That's what the world is dying for, is love. Now, God wanted to show, the apostles, rather, wanted to show us what God's power was. That's what His power was. He takes us over to the still-formed body of the Lord Jesus. Dead, nails to the hands, the pale cheek, He's laying in the grave. A Roman seal over the top of a great big stone that taken many men to roll it up there. There he lay. The Roman centurion said he's dead. The guard said he's dead. They signed his death and everything announced him dead. They took him and laid him there for three days and nights. But early one morning, God wants you to show you his power. I can see a bunch of soldiers in a run like a rabbit with a hound after them. Just as hard as they can go. For standing by the grave stands an angel that just took his fingers pushed back the stone. I can see that dead form of faith with paleness, no blood where that fear in bonding. I can see the very brush of health in his cheeks. I can see him standing there holding all hail and all power. Yes. I can see him a few days later addressing his apostles to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature and these signs shall follow him until I come. The works that I do shall you also and so forth. Watch! I begin to notice under his feet there's coming life. He begins to lift up. What is it? He breaks and defies the law of gravitation. God's power. Why was it? He was the center of gravitation. He begins to be lifted up. And if I, if I go away, I'll come again to receive him to myself. There's God's power. There's breaking gravitation. You know, let's take a little trip just a moment if you want to see God's power. And I'll ask you to be real reverent a minute before closing. May you dearly understand that it isn't church, it isn't intellectual, it isn't knowing the Bible, it isn't any of these things. 
It's God's love, the Holy Spirit, in the middle of that spirit that you quit drinking and quit smoking and quit lying. Then God's Holy Spirit in that spirit begins to make it work just exactly right. Then love, then, then you're on the mountaintop all the time with it, things are coming right or going right, you still got the victory. That's it. Live or die? Why, well, when he's going to cut Paul's head off, he said, I fought a good fight. Then it's the course, kept the faith. He's forth, I'll go up for me, a crown of righteous, Lord, the righteous, just look in that day. Not only me, but all that love is appearing. And the grave looked back at him, and death looked back at him, and said, Paul, we're going to have you in a few minutes. But that main spring was still ticking. He said, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? Show me where you can steer me. Show me where you can make me take the cross off. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see it? What is it? Who are you? How big are you anyhow? Or how? Or who are you anyhow? Walk around the town, you and I. And a 150-pound body's only worth 84 cents. But, brother, you act like you own the country. And that don't exclude preachers. That's right. Oh, I've got the biggest church in the city. I don't have to. Well, you might not have to do that, but you might have to repent someday. That's right. I'm a Presbyterian. I don't... Oh, go ahead. See, that's all right. I don't mind you being a Presbyterian. God doesn't either. Well, you just got that mainspring in there. That's the main thing. That's the main thing. If you have, you won't feel that way about it. I was asking a doctor the other day, a few months ago. I said, Doctor, I want to ask you something. Is it true that I renew my life every time I eat? I said, yes, sir. I said, then is it true that there's 16 elements of the earth in my body? I'm made up of 16 elements. That's right. If oxygen, well, calcium, potash, petroleum, cosmic light, and all 16 different elements go together, and it makes you. Now, I want to ask you. I said, when well, every time I eat, then I renew my life. I said, that's right. I said, why is it I'm eating beans, potatoes, and meat and bread? Just like I did when I was 16 years old. Every time I eat, I got bigger and stronger. And now every time I eat, I'm getting older and weaker. If you're pouring water out of a jug into a glass, and it gets half full, and then more you pour, the further down the water goes. Tell me by science how that's done. It cannot be explained only by God's Word. What is it? It's an appointment, and you're going to meet it. Right. It was appointed unto man once to die. From that to judgment. And death set in to you when you was about 22 to 25. And no matter how good you treat yourself, how much Max Factors put new uh, lips and everything on, it won't do one bit of good. Sister, you're going right back to that appointment. Right. You might wear a tuxedo and shun a man with a pair of overhauls on, but my brother, you're just a little bit of potash and calcium mixed together, that's all. And you know that, made out of the same kind of material. Then look, when you took a notion, your mother did, to have a little boy in her home, her and daddy, a little girl, did they call up the doctor and say, Doctor, I want you to scrape up off the earth some potash and calcium, some petroleum, and each day come and make him with brown eyes and brown hair and make it wavy and fix little cysts with the long hair and the manicures or whatever it is. I want you, did he do it that way? No, sir, he couldn't do it. So you are the dust of the earth, yet God made you, and he's the only one that can make you. How does he do it? Through the Fuji. Where'd the food come from? The earth. Now wait just a minute. 
Now all you Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals, sit still just a minute and listen to this. All you that are so stuck on your denominations and how well you can do this or what a melodious voice you got and you're going to sing in the choir, be careful in a love in hell. Notice. Watch. Now. Why is it then if, I, if I'm going to live physically, I have to eat and the food that I eat turns into blood cells? It's a mysterious something that they can't take that food and no other way can they turn it into blood cells. Only God does that beating your body. Develop. They can't get a machinery or nothing else. Why? The blood cells got life in it. And they can't produce life. They can't produce life. Notice. Now, then every day if I live, I have to live by dead substance. Something has to die so I can live. If I eat beef, the cow dies. If I eat mutton, the sheep dies. If I eat fish, the fish dies. If I eat bread, the wheat dies. If I eat potatoes, the potato dies. And the only way that I can live is by dead substance. That's what, by a new life. The Son of God gave His life that it might come back on you. Only life. If something doesn't die, you do not live. And if the physical being has to live by dead substance, what about the spirit within you? Something has to die so you can live again. Church, not an organization, not a group of people, but the Son of God died, and that main spring along is how God picked his church off. Not by shaking hands, not by who might dress better or whatever more, but you live by dead substance. You might belong to a better church or what you call a better church. You might be an isolated, not be your intellectual, but by the Spirit, not the power, not the might, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Notice. Now, let's take a little trip, just for a minute. Did you know when God in the beginning when this old earth stood up out of the waters, it was bleak and bare and a desert. There was not one speck of life anywhere on it. Science tells us to come off the sun. Whatever it come from or wherever it come from, there wasn't one speck of life. But now listen, if your body is made out of the dust of the earth, get it? Your body laid on this earth in the beginning. Is that right? All the calcium, potash, petroleum laid on this earth at the beginning when the earth stood up out of the water. Now watch what's taking place and keep this in your mind. The locusts went out of God. The great Holy Spirit. And let's visualize it. I can see him with his two big wings. As he looks over the earth. And he begins to brooding over the earth. You know what brood is? Like a hen with her chicken. Her brood. And as she, as the Holy Spirit begins to brood through the earth, I can see some petroleum and stuff coming together. And a little Easter lily stuck his head up for the first thing on earth. And Oh, God said, that's beautiful. Just keep rooting. After a while, grass and plants begin to come up on the earth. The Holy Spirit kept rooting. Then what happened? Along come birds flying out of the dust. The Holy Spirit kept rooting. And after a while, a man came up out of the earth. And God stopped his creation. And he looked at him said, this is wonderful, but Adam looks lonesome. So he goes over and takes a little rib out of his side and makes him a beautiful little bride. Now, I can see them as in this day, 
little Eve holding to Adam's arm as they walked down to the garden of paradise. No death, no sorrow. She'll never need any makeup. No, sir. She's beautiful forever. There she was holding to Adam's arm. And after a while, the wind blows. And she said, Oh, Adam, that wind. He said, Peace. And it obeyed him. He was the Son of God. After a while, there come a great roar. Little Eve couldn't get scared now. No scare about it. It's perfect before God. A great roar come up. She'd never heard it before. But, you know, Adam had named him. He was a lion. Leo the lion. And he said, come here, Leo. And the lion come over and another growl come. It was she to the tiger. And he played with them. And they were like kittens around Adam and Eve. You know, it got late in the evening. And Eve said, oh, Adam, the sun is going down. And he said, we must go to worship. Is it something about the evening time you want to get alone? And when it was time to go to worship, he took her by the arm, like the modern son of God does today to his wife. And they went up to the cathedral. Oh, it didn't have a great spire on top of it and plush seats. It was perhaps a bunch of trees standing. And as they knelt down and began to pray, the sun was going down. And the Holy Spirit that had brewed them from the dust hung that sacred light into the bushes. And as it began to make love to them, I can hear him say, Children, have you enjoyed your stay today on the earth that the Lord thy God has kept thee? Oh, yes, Father. We have enjoyed this. Oh, we love it. What's taking place? He said, Children, the sun is going down. I come down to kiss you. Good night. You know what it is? I just love to take my wife by the hand and go into the bed to my little Joseph and pick his little hands up and say, Mother, look at it. It just looks something like your hand. She say, Dad, you know, I believe his eyes are set just like yours. See, we were made in the image of God. And that strain still makes us love it. And while I kiss little Joseph goodnight, Slip over to little Sarah and kiss her goodnight. Over to little Rebecca and kiss her goodnight. There's something in my heart that just, oh, just love. And when God kissed his first little family goodnight, and now I lay me down to sleep. He laid down the old lion. He laid down she to the tiger. Nothing could harm them. Father was watching over them. No harm or danger could come. Do you know we're on the road back? Now, they were the children of God because the Holy Spirit had brewed them from the earth. Now notice, be real reverent, just a moment. Notice, please. After that, sin came in. Now, look what it done. It marred man. God won't be defeated. If woman did what she did and has to bring life into the world, God brings you into the world, makes you out of dust the earth, just as no other piling up of cosmic, cosmic lights and things will ever do it. You can't bottle up enough light, you can't put enough petroleum with it, it'll never make a human being, only God can do it. And God made you what you are. How do you do it? Out of the dust of the earth. Now, look, if it's taken... The Holy Spirit to brew me from the earth or call me out of the dust of the earth. And now I am based on the basis of free moral agency to receive it or to turn it down. If I want life, I can have it. If I want to refuse it, I am a free moral agent. I can take the devil in. But if I want God, I can take God. And that's before every person to ever come on the earth. But look, by my own mental conceptions, I can't have it. What is it? It took the Holy Spirit to bring me from the earth. If the Holy Spirit made me what I am without having any choice, how much more can He bring me back out of the dusty earth by choice? 
not my intellectuals, not my church membership, but the Holy Ghost that's brooding down and calling to me, I answer back to it. He raised his hands and swore that he had raised me up in the last days. Oh, brother, intellectual liberty, middle conceptual liberty, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings the human being to his place. Make your choice, oh, happy day. I fix my choice on thee, my Savior and my God. No matter what the rest of the world does, it's sinking sand, my choice is on thee. The Holy Spirit that's moving down through his word, saying, this is my word, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeded out of the mouth of God. Yes, Holy Spirit. I promise eternal life to them that believe. I believe, Holy Spirit, I'll seal you. Then watch your life begin to move. Not the church, the Holy Spirit. Not the denomination, the Holy Spirit. Now, what happens? When the old spirit is gone out of a man, the Bible said he, the devil's gone out of a man, he walks in dry places and comes back and found the house all swept out. You know what happens? You once lived in old Tin Can Alley. That's right. Where all the devils and rats and everything else live. Fusses and fights and stews and arguments. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, he can't live in a place like that. That's the reason people today can shout and scream and go on, but live any kind of life afterwards. The Holy Spirit, when it moves in, it takes God's big bulldozer and comes down and digs that old alley up throws the dirt out, bears it in the sea of forgetfulness, and passes off a nice big place, and puts up a great big mansion, and he lives there, and the flowers of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, and mercies, and kindness, and faith is blooming around this house. Oh! That's it! I just got the quick preach, and I ain't even got my text good yet. Look! That's it. When the Holy Spirit moves in, the tin cans and rats, lies, backbiting, selfishness, indifference with other Christians all move out. And if you still got them, it shows the Holy Spirit has never cast off your life yet. Amen. Get rid of your rats. The Holy Ghost takes away them differences. It makes you full of love, joy, peace. Look at the flowers blooming around. Satan just can't step his dirty foot on there. Or your life is dead and you're hid in God through Christ and sealed by the Holy Ghost. Then what comes forth? Well, the Holy Spirit's living there. These flowers just actually accompany the Holy Spirit. Now, you can't go and get some of these artificial flowers and set them out in the yard because they haven't got any life in them. And you say, well, I've joined church. I guess I'm just going to have to be this way. You're a miserable wretch. Right. But when the Holy Ghost is there, it's just automatically love. Oh, I can pull every hair in her head out. Mm, that old one, that old trinity, that old this, that or the other. Oh, I wouldn't speak to her. Well, I go down to that meeting. Dr. So I should show her will love. Oh, you old Pharisee. A Pharisee means an actor. You're only kind of act religion. If you had the real Holy Ghost in there, you'd put a love in your heart for every man that breathes the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Pharisee means actor. You're trying to act something that you're not. you got an artificial power. Your house is made out of pasteboard and rats is eaten up. Right. The Holy Ghost runs the church. The Holy Ghost is the love of God. Why, man who tried to express the love of God, one of them said, if the whole ocean was eight and the sky the parts of maize, every stalk on earth of quill and every man of stripe but by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean cross, or could the scroll contain the whole ghost that's inside the sky? That's the Holy Spirit. That's what Phoenix needs. That's what the world needs. That's what the church has got to have. Of love and joy and peace. And then all your 
scruples are settled, and we're one big united church going on for the glory of God. Let us pray. Thank it over. It's up to you. This is the word. Will you receive it, or will you turn it down? Are you guilty? Are you living in the devil's alley, trying to make yourself act like a Christian? Or is the love of God just flowing out and the flowers are blooming forever? Right around God's great big holy house, where the holiness of God just actually brings up these flowers. A sweet-smelling Savior is around you all the time. You don't hear any criticism. You don't pay any attention to it. No matter if it's sweet and easy because the Holy Spirit's in there clicking off your life. If it's not, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you raise your hand, not to me, but to God, and say, God, be merciful to me and give me that type of life. Would you do it? God bless you. You, 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 you. Yes, over here, you. God sees every hand. He knows your desire. Up in the balconies, anywhere. Now remember, friends, I'm only a minister. I can only speak as he tells me to speak. I try to follow him. And stay in the Word. Now, if that life doesn't accompany you, if no matter I speak in Christ's name, you say, Brother Branham, I've had some wonderful experiences. That doesn't do it, brother. Jesus never said, by their experience you shall know them. But by their fruit shall you know them. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Joy? Long-suffering? Meekness, love, patience, kindness, gentleness, faith. Is that accompanying your life? Don't be deceived or it's in the road, friends. This might be the last time you get a chance to check up. Better do it. How many more in here? Many of you ought to raise your hand. You know in a, God bless you, son. God bless you. Someone else, raise your, God bless you. Just raise your hand, God, and you, God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Someone else. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Someone else. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Up in the balcony. Now, you're the judge. Remember, I... God bless you, lady. Everybody in prayer. I'm going to stand at your face at the judgment bar. And you're going to give an account for what you do with this message this afternoon. Your mind, the way you're thinking now, is going to vibrate on God's radar screen at the day of judgment. If it's a thousand years from today, it'll still vibrate. What do you think about it? Is that life? Is that stuff in your life?
head bowed, there's the word of the Lord to you. The message backed up exactly what I said. Now, would you come in confession upon the preaching of the word, the witness of the Spirit? Now, you know your heart. I don't. You know your heart. Walk down here, right down around the altar here. Let me get you by the hand here. Let's stand here and pray and ask God to take that old selfishness out of you, them old ups and downs that's chaffing you, and come here and stand here and get a new spirit in your life today. Oh, you say, Brother Bram, I've already shouted, I've spoke with tongues. That's all right. That's good. That's fine. But I'm talking about something else. Come down here now. Get the mainspring in your heart. That thing, God bless you, sir. That's good to walk right out to be the first one. I like that. Come right on down here now. If you're without that type of life, as your, tonight may be too far for you. Oh, you say, I belong to church. No matter what you belong to, you come here. You ought to belong to Christ. If you're guilty, come. Come right out of the balcony. Come on down. I remember. Oh, you say, Brother Bannon, I've heard the messages so many times. This may be your last one, too. Yeah. 
sea shall take heart again. Oh, my blessed friends of Christ, see your confession. Now, don't stand here thinking you're not going to get something when the whole sky is full of these blessings. You might not be all worked up over it. Maybe you've had a lot of that already. It ain't working up over. It isn't getting worked up and emotional. It's coming reverently before God. It's coming there and saying, God, now I believe. And you put in me that which operates my life. How many of you standing here believe it? Let's see your hands. You're already making your confession to God. You're rising up and standing here. Proves that you're sincere in it. Proves that you are. Now, I want to pray for you first. And then I want you to pray for yourself. But first, I want you to settle down, everybody. Now, if you're all feel that you're absolutely justified in doing what you're doing. If you're sure that you're justified, there's not a spot on your door, but your life is ticking just according to God's Holy Spirit, making you live the life of this Bible. If you're satisfied, remember this day will come into judgment. Brother, I tell you, I'd rather walk out in the face of my pastor, church, and everything and make it right now than to try to do it then because you've got mercy now. You have it then. You're in judgment then. All right.
ไทยรุ่งเราจะทำให้ความรู้สึกของเราเปลี่ยนไปเราจะทำให้ความรู้สึกของเราเปลี่ยนไปเราจะทำให้ความรู้สึกของเราเปลี่ยนไปเราจะทำให้ความรู้